When you hear the word theosis, you probably think of Eastern Orthodoxy, but what if I told you Calvinists have a version of theosis as well? Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we build churches in Minecraft while talking about Christianity. And today, I'm going to be talking about the Reformed or Calvinist approach to theosis. Because I am a Presbyterian, which is part of the Reformed Calvinist tradition, and a lot of people these days are talking about theosis, which is a doctrine often associated with Eastern Orthodoxy, but I'm trying to say that all Christian traditions have some sort of version of theosis. The difference is in the details. So what does theosis mean? Well, theosis means union with God. A lot of times when people talk about theosis, they even talk about becoming God in some sense. Not in the Mormon sense of actually becoming what God is. You know, Mormons believe God was once a man like we are. God the Father has a physical body and we will one day become what God is and have our own planet to rule over just like God rules over our planet. Not a single historic Christian tradition teaches that. Not a single non-heretical Christian denomination teaches that. So none of us are saying that. What theosis means, becoming God in that sense, means partaking of the divine nature. And there is a verse in one of Peter's epistles that does talk about being partakers of the divine nature. So theosis is in the Bible. So that's why all Christian traditions over the years have had to do something with it, have had to explain it in some way. And I think that there's a spectrum of how far people are willing to go with that. I think the Eastern Orthodox among, you know, Nicene Christianity have taken it the furthest. But as I said, every Christian tradition, every uh, mainstream Christian tradition has done something with it. And that includes the Calvinists. Now, the reason you don't hear the word theosis in a lot of Calvinist writings is we have a different word for it. We call it union with Christ. But if you look at how Calvinists describe union with Christ, it's very similar to the orthodox idea of theosis, but with a few key differences. So there's really two main big differences between the Calvinist version of theosis and the orthodox version. Number one is the distinction between justification and sanctification. And number two, the difference is what exactly we partake of when we partake of God, which is biblical terminology. So the biggest distinction between Protestantism and all the other non-Protestant groups like Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Oriental Orthodoxy is Protestants distinguish between justification and sanctification. These are big theological words for ideas that are not really that complicated at all. Justification is God declaring us righteous. God declares us righteous, God forgives our sins, and makes it so that we can enter his presence, we can be members of his kingdom. That's what justification is. In other words, justification is how you are considered good enough to get into heaven. But we think justification is distinct from sanctification. God, act God declaring us righteous is distinct from God actually making us more righteous, and that's what sanctification is. Sanctification is God actually changing us, God actually making us more holy. So we believe that logically justification comes before sanctification. So first, God declares us righteous, and then God actually makes us more righteous. So when Protestants say that salvation is by faith alone, that's all that we actually mean. We are not claiming that faith is all that matters and works don't matter. We are claiming that faith is what leads to justification. We believe that justification is by faith, but justification will always lead to sanctification, which is God actually making us more righteous. And the Protestant reformers thought it was very important to distinguish between justification and sanctification. So justification is like a binary. It's a yes or a no. Either you are justified before God or you're not. Now, not all Protestants believe in once saved, always saved. Like Lutherans believe that uh, either you're justified or you're not, but you could go from a state of being justified to not being justified because Lutherans believe you can lose your salvation. Like, a lot of people think all Protestants believe you can't lose your salvation. That's really only a Baptist belief. Most historic Protestants have rejected, like, a, a strict, rigid version of once saved, always saved, like Baptists often have. Uh, but e either way, for Protestants, justification is always a binary. So it's not like this person is 10% justified, this person is 60% justified. Either you're justified before God or you're not. 
sanctification, all Protestants would agree, is not a binary. It's a process. So when you are an early Christian, when you're like a baby Christian, not very mature in your faith, you're not going to be all that sanctified. But as you grow in your Christian faith, as you partake in the means of grace, which are the word and the sacraments, your sanctification increases. And even though we say justification is by faith alone, and sometimes we shorten that and say salvation is by faith alone, but at the same time, for Protestants, at least traditionally, sanctification is a part of the overall process of salvation. So the doctrine of sola fide isn't exactly salvation by faith alone, it's justification by faith alone. And justification will always lead to sanctification, but at the end of the day, you do need to actually be made more righteous to get into heaven. It's not like um, you can be a total serial killer and then immediately go into heaven as a serial killer. You need your heart to be changed first, although we believe that for everyone who is truly justified and who remains in the faith, God will handle their sanctification, so it's not something we need to worry about. But we would say if someone claims to have faith and they show no signs of being sanctified, every other Christian has the right to question their justification. That's why St. James says we are justified by works and not by faith alone. Um, St. Paul says we are justified by faith, not by works. The only way to explain that is to say that they're not talking about justification in the same sense. So that's why the Protestants say that uh, St. Paul is talking about justification quorum Deo, or before God, whereas James is talking about justification quorum Mundo, or before the world. So, you know, Fundamentally, we're justified by our faith in Christ, but other people can't see our faith. Our faith is invisible. They can only see the works that our faith produces. So it's right to say that our faith is justified before others by the works that it produces. That it produces, And in that sense, you could say justification is by works. But the important thing is we distinguish between justification and sanctification. So what theosis does is theosis is salvation for Eastern Orthodoxy. We both agree that theosis becoming more like God is sanctification, essentially, because we would all agree that sanctification is being conformed to the image of Christ. It's being Christified. It's being made more like Jesus. It's being restored to a right relationship with God. So we'd all agree that theosis is basically just sanctification. But the difference is when they, when the Eastern Orthodox don't really make much of a distinction between justification and sanctification, or justification and theosis, they make it seem like we are justified directly by our theosis, by our sanctification, by the process of us being made more holy. That's why Eastern Orthodoxy are often, Eastern Orthodox are often very skeptical of people having assurance of salvation. Now there are Bible verses that say you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, uh, but there are there are also Bible passages that say you should have assurance of salvation, like one of the verses in 1 John says, By this we know that we are his, we belong to Christ, because he has given us his spirit. Christ has given us his spirit, which also proves the filioque, by the way. Um, but... If you, so you should have assurance, but because Eastern Orthodox believe salvation is like a, a process, justification is a process, they don't really make much of a distinction between justification and sanctification, and they say in some sense you are justified by the process of getting more divinized and united to God, it's really hard to know if you can have any assurance of salvation, because it's really hard to know if you've done enough theosis, because in the because they don't really believe you should have assurance of salvation, the way they see it, and correct me in the comments if I'm misrepresenting Eastern Orthodoxy, they see it as we can't really know in this life whether we will have eternal life in the end. I've heard a lot of Orthodox people say that heaven and hell are really the same thing. Objectively, it's the presence of God, but for those who have been sanctified, uh, the presence of God feels like heaven, and for those who are wicked, the presence of God feels like hell. So, Depending on how much theosis or sanctification you have in this life, that will determine what your experience of eternity is going to be. And there's some, not all, but some Eastern Orthodox believe in toll houses, which is where after you die, your soul ascends through these little um, spiritual places where angels and demons fight over your soul. And the demons will say, oh, he belongs to us because he looked at women lustfully this many times. And then the angels will say, oh, no, he belongs to us because he was faithful to his wife in all these circumstances. Um, and that's 
terrifying. That's like the Eastern Orthodox version of purgatory, but at least in purgatory, there's a promise of eventual salvation for everyone in purgatory. Um, the Eastern Orthodox doctrine of toll houses, which I know not all of them believe, but many of them do, it, it's basically like your salvation is completely up in the air when you're in the toll houses, and there's no way to know for sure if you're going to make it through them, but your chances of salvation in the end are determined by how united to God you were in this life. So once again, we Protestants are fine with talking about theosis as long as, number one, we distinguish between theosis and justification, because we could use theosis interchangeably for sanctification. I'm okay with that. Jordan Cooper likes to use the word uh, Christification. He comes from a Lutheran perspective. I think that's perfectly valid. Um, so we could do that. And, of course, I'm going to talk about the difference between, you know, what exactly we partake of uh, created versus uncreated graces from God. But if you are justified by the amount by which you are united to God, there is never a way to know if you've done enough. That's why even the most devout and holy Orthodox monks will say, I, I hope I am saved in the end. Um... Now, if you listen to a lot of Orthodox writers like St. Gregory Palamas, I've been reading a lot of Palamas lately, um, it does not sound like the gospel to me. It sounds like a gospel of asceticism. A Palamas basically says the only way to really have a good chance at salvation is to lead a life avoiding all worldly pleasures, which includes being a virgin for life, and that's what a lot of monks did. And that sounds... a some of either Palamas himself or the Neo-Palamite tradition definitely has at least a little bit of Eastern spirituality influence. Like, there's a little bit of... It can sound a bit Buddhist or Hindu to say that, you know, you are saved by abstaining from all worldly pleasures and detaching yourself from this world. And uh, there, there's a lot of sus things about the hesychastic prayer tradition, which is the Eastern Orthodox monastic tradition, and I'm not educated enough on it to fully critique it. You should listen to um, Pastor Joshua Shooping if you want to know more about that. He's a he's an ex-Orthodox priest who left the Orthodox Church. He's now a Protestant pastor. Uh, so I don't know much about that, but what I do know is that uh, as a Protestant, I distinguish between justification and sanctification. So what I'm saying is if being a monk increases your chances at salvation, and when we're talking about salvation, we're talking about like literal eternity, heaven versus hell. If you can never know for sure if you're going to be saved, and if being a monk increases your chances at salvation, there is no logical reason for anyone to not be a hesychastic, ascetic monk. There's no reason for anyone not to. Like, even if like the average um, Orthodox layperson had an 80% chance of salvation, and the Orthodox monk had like a 90% chance of salvation. If if heaven or hell was on the line, you we would all be monks. So what the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone says is that yes, while some Christians will be more sanctified in this life than others, while sanctification is very important, and while you should question your own salvation if you are not being sanctified, at the end of the day, you are not saved by the degree to which you are sanctified. Yes, if you're not being sanctified, you probably have not been justified either. But you're not saved by the degree to which you've been sanctified. Justification is a yes or no. It's a binary. It's a Boolean value. And sanctification is a process. I like to think justification corresponds to the sacrament of baptism, and sanctification corresponds to Holy Communion. So baptism is a once-and-done deal, unless you're one of those Baptists or non-denominationals who get ba gets baptized five times. But generally speaking, baptism is supposed to be a once-and-done deal. Either you are baptized or you are not baptized. You don't. There's no. There's no one who says, "Oh, I'm, I'm sort of baptized. Maybe later." in my life, I'll be more baptized. No, either you're baptized or you're not. So I don't believe in, uh, I don't believe that everyone who is baptized is automatically saved in that moment. Okay, there's a, I'm, I'm seeing this again. Oh, there's diamonds here. Nice. I don't believe that everyone who's baptized is automatically saved in that moment. Oh, there's diamonds. Um, but 
I do believe that there is a real spiritual connection or sa sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified in baptism. So we can say that baptism saves at least for those who trust in Christ. So baptism corresponds to justification because baptism is a yes or no just the way justification is a yes or no. I think Holy Communion, the Eucharist, corresponds to sanctification because sanctification is a process throughout your whole life and Holy Communion is something that you take over and over again. Baptism is an initiatory sacrament and communion is a particip par participatory sacrament. Uh, so I think that's a good, I think that's a good justification for the difference, no pun intended, for the difference between justification and sanctification, for the, the distinction between them, is the distinction between baptism and Holy Communion. But anyway, so that's the first difference between a Calvinist approach to theosis and an Eastern Orthodox approach to theosis. We're cool with the idea of theosis as long as it's not being conflated with justification. And we would say justification flows from our union with Christ, but like I said, we are not justifi justified by the degree to which we have been united with God. So the second big distinction is what exactly is it we partake of? Like, yes, we all agree that we partake of God in some sense. The Bible directly says that you have to reckon with that passage somehow if you have a high view of Scripture. We also all agree that we're not Mormons. We don't believe we literally become what God is in his essence. The Eastern Orthodox don't believe we uh, partake of the divine essence because they believe the divine essence is completely beyond us. It's unknowable. Uh, we can only partake of God's energies. They have what's called the essence energies distinction, where there's a distinction between God's essence, meaning what God is, and God's energies, meaning his actions eternally flowing from him, but both are eternal and both can be called God. So in Eastern Orthodoxy, there can be a distinction between God's essence, I mean, what he is in and of himself. We cannot know God's essence. God's essence is a complete mystery according to Eastern Orthodoxy, but God's energies, like, you know, love, power, and holiness they are sort of beams that flow from God. Like God's essence is like the sun for them and God's energies are like the rays of the sun for them. So that's the essence energies distinction. And according to them, we can partake of God's uncreated energies. So the Eastern Orthodox interpretation of the verse about becoming partakers of the divine nature is that we partake of God's eternal uncreated energies. And because God's energies can be called God along with God's essence, we are partaking of God in a real sense. Now the Reformed version is a little bit different. I think it's more Trinitarian and Christological. We interpret being partakers of the divine nature to mean being raised up into the Trinitarian fellowship of God. It's sort of like what St. Athanasius said, that God became man so man might become God. God took on created flesh so he might raise the creation up into his eternal life. That's why I believe in the absolute necessity of the incarnation, by the way. I'm more of a scotist than a Thomist. God is the infinite and we are finite, so God God needs to become finite like us so we can participate in his infinite eternal life. But the difference is we have a more strong creator-creature distinction. Nothing about us is actually going to become infinite or uncreated. We just participate in this inter-trinitarian fellowship that has existed for all eternity, and here's why. This is why we believe in the filioque, and this is why the western version of theosis is based on the filioque. The filioque is Latin for and the Son, because Western Christianity, meaning Catholics and Protestants, believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, whereas Eastern Orthodox believe the Holy Spirit only proceeds from the Father. The reason we believe he proceeds from the Father and the Son is because traditionally we describe the Holy Spirit as the fellowship between the Father and the Son. An analogy St. Augustine used is the Holy Spirit is like the love that exists between the Father and the Son. The reason I think this is biblical, and it makes sense with theosis, is the Bible says the Holy Spirit dwells inside all Christians. So it makes sense to say that theosis is when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we are participating in the inter-Trinitarian relations in some sense, because in some sense the Holy Spirit is the relation between the Father and the Son. And it also makes sense with the fact that we can only consider God our Father by being united to Christ, who is God's Son. It says we have the right to be adopted as children of God. It does not mean we are children of God by nature. We are not children of God simply by being God's creation. We are children of God by being married to Christ, who is God's Son. Uh, we are adopted into the family of God. We are adopted into the eternal life, eternal fellowship of God. 
So we are not actually being made eternal or uncreated, but this intertrinitarian eternal fellowship that has existed for all eternity becomes extended to us at a point in time. But that's more of a theoretical distinction, I think. That's more of like a nitpicking philosophically. I think the really important distinction that matters is that we need to distinguish between justification and sanctification. And this is a very, very practical matter. I get messages a lot of the time from young men who are struggling with sin. Now, I don't think they should be messaging me. They should be messaging their pastors. But a lot of these kids, you know, don't go to church. Or they do go to church. They're a member of a church, but they don't attend as frequently as they probably should. So I very, very frequently get messages from young men who are struggling with sin. A lot of times young men will message me saying, I don't think I'm saved because I, I can't stop sinning. And I'll always be like, okay, aside from pornography, uh, are you struggling with sin? And they'll be like, yeah, no, not really. <laughs> it's almost always that. But even when it's not, when people are struggling with sin but they really want to be good Christians. They need some short sort of assurance. So when the people I'm talking to are Protestant, I can assure them by saying, yeah, I can. you're definitely struggling with sin, but I can tell that the fact that you care so much about this means you have true faith in Christ, probably. And as long as you're faithful to Christ, as long as you don't leave the faith, as long as you really care about having faith in Christ, God will forgive your sins. Because we believe that there is a distinction between God's act of forgiving our sins and God's act of actually making us more righteous. So when someone's Protestant, I can actually help give them assurance of their salvation. Now, it's not my job to do that. It should be a pastor who's doing that. I'm not a pastor. But sometimes I, these kids need just a little bit of encouragement just to even get themselves back into church to begin with. Um, but when I have talked to a lot of Eastern Orthodox people, who really do struggle with sin, and I think they are true passionate Christians and they want to be better, but I have like nothing to give them assurance, because if you read a lot of Orthodox writers like Palamas, they very heavily imply that if you die in a state of being addicted to a certain carnal sin, you're probably not going to be saved, because they conflate justification and sanctification. They make it seem like you are justified by the degree to which you have been sanctified, and that is... Asceticism is not the gospel. Sanctification is very important. It's very important for us to be conformed to the image of Christ. But again, we are not justified before God by the degree to which we do that. So if you're Protestant, you can have theosis. You can have this mystical encounter with God. You can be transformed by the presence of God. You can be transformed by your communion with God. And if you want some Protestant resources on this, you should read The Scots Confession by John Knox. John Knox has a very, very high view of the Eucharist in The Scots Confession. John Knox is the father of Presbyterianism. And he literally says that the purpose of communion is basically theosis. The purpose of taking Holy Communion is so that we live in Christ and Christ lives in us. And we are transformed by Christ living in us. And I have so many powerful testimonies of the Eucharist from myself and others. Yes, in Protestant churches. I know some of you guys don't think Protestant churches have a valid Eucharist because we don't have apostolic succession. But then when I bring up how Anglicans do have apostolic succession, they'll be like, no, you still don't have valid Eucharist because you're Protestant and Protestant is bad because I saw a lesbian pastor in a TikTok once. So, anyway. But if you're Protestant, you can still have this concept of theosis. I think union with Christ is a better term for it. Uh, but it's also good that we distinguish between justification and sanctification so that while theosis is the end goal for all Christians, it's not the beginning. It's not what we are justified by. So if you have faith in Christ... No matter what sin you're struggling with, there is hope for you. If you have faith in Christ, that is what matters, and God will sanctify you. God will take care of the rest. Faith is fundamentally what matters, because if God actually did judge us according to the degree to which we've been sanctified, if we were justified by the degree to which we were sanctified, we would all go to hell. Because even Christians... Even the holiest of Christians who are transformed by God's presence and communion with God in their lives, the holiest of saints and monks still fall short of the glory of God and still would go to hell if it weren't for God's grace. So thanks for watching this, and I'm going to speed this up while I do some more work on my little house.